Wonderful. Hello, everyone. I'm so sorry for the lack of video on uh, Jules' side and my side. It seems like we've got Zoom video gremlins happening for us, and that it just doesn't seem to be working no matter how hard we try. Um, but thank you so much for joining us today. So if you don't know about Connectable Life, Connectable Life is an online platform where you can find a specialist of um, any uh, therapy specialist or health specialist that you might need. Jules is somebody that we consult with often. She is absolutely incredible. She's been a massive influence in my life and my husband's lives and ultimately in my children's lives. She has helped us through multiple different areas um, of health and just helping us understand why things are happening the way they are. Um, so a little bit about Jules. Uh, Julie Allen Rowland has been in practice in the health industry for more than 25 years. She started off as a podiatrist and was therefore registered with the HPCSA. She completed a degree in psychology and communication. She is certified in health and nutrition from the UK. She is also certified in kinesiology and exercise science. She then moved into functional medicine. Functional medicine is a science-based discipline that addresses the interplay between your genetic inheritance, your functional cellular status, your nutrient status, the impact of stress and exercise and how that relates to either addressing already established chronic disease or improve the risk of inheritable chronic disease. Functional medicine sees the body as a whole with interconnected parts. Jules has had patients all over the world and addresses conditions ranging from weight loss to depression to autoimmune disease. And as we will hear tonight, integrated pain management. You know, I hear all the time how different people are struggling with pain. Pain seems to be a constant in the world that we are living with. And uh, we tend to just pop pills. We either go on anti-inflammatory, uh, different pain medications, headache medications, antibiotics, you name it. We want a pill for everything. But that doesn't fix the problem at the end of the line. It just is a short-term solution for how we're feeling now. We are going to hear from Jules, her incredible knowledge and um, how we can live a more pain-free and holistic life. So thank you so much, Jules, for everything you're going to show us and teach us tonight. Well, thanks so much, Stace. And, uh, you know, all of these subjects, I, you know, I love sharing the information because I think long-term, you're right. I think people are becoming more and more inflamed as time goes on. You know, we're exposed to a lot of toxins. The food that we eat is not ideal. The stress that we experience in our lives causes not only issues with our mood, but actually it causes almost a low-grade inflammation in our body as well. So there are a lot of factors that lead, that sort of bleed into how we respond to pain. So Look, one of the one of the the things that we tend to do is, of course, if we're in pain, the first thing that we want to do is to rush up and get some type of pain pill. And you know, it's understandable. But if we've got chronic pain, then we need to be aware that the medication that we're taking has consequences in our body that brings us into a downward spiral more than an upward spiral. So before I get into it, you know, I. I won't read through this, but all the information that we're discussing now is for informational purposes only. If you are in pain or you, you've been treated for anything, please discuss any changes that you want to make with your primary care practitioner so that you can work with your practitioner to address whatever your health issues are. Stace has already gone through all the information about me, so I'm not going to go through it again. So, in terms of the applications for pain management, they, you know, there are various types of pain. You know, we, we we sometimes only associate pain with, you know, when we rip our toenail off or we stub our toe or we break our, our arm or something. But for people who experience pain, there are lots of forms of pain. And some of them are absolutely unbearable, especially when you're dealing with the neuropathic pain. So you've got neuropathic pains, which are pains that are associated with your nerves. So shingles, for example, any diabetic neuropathies, cancer pain. Cancer pain 
even if, for example, we might have a cancer that's in a particular area, cancer pain is a pain that tends to move around the body a little bit and also unbearable. And as the cancer progresses, then obviously you, you're dealing with more and more pain. Trigeminal or facial pain, these are neuro, this is a neurological pain as well. Migraines, very common and very common with women. Women are much more prone to develop migraines than are men. The normal ones we know about, which are the musculoskeletal pains, neck, lower back, all of those sort of issues, teeth, bones, joints, and of course, I'm sure there are lots that, I, that people might be experiencing that I've not actually mentioned here. So why am I even bothering to discuss pain with you? And I, you know, it's because generally pain is what drives us to practitioners. So we will often, if we deal with some sort of suboptimal problems. So for example, maybe we'll be dealing with a little bit of brain fog or poor concentration, but there's no pain. Very often we'll deal with it or we'll, we will just bear with it. But what happens with pain is that when we or patients, if we are practitioners, are dealing with pain, the, the patient in front of us needs help. Patients don't know what to do. Very often practitioners have only one route of treatment. And their one route of treatment is prescription of any anti-inflammatories or analgesics. But if you're going to look at sustained success, we need to multi-layer. We need to stack our pain relief because we can't always just take pain pills indefinitely. One has to have a look at what is the inherent cause of the pain. Easy if it's just a broken arm. But if it's not a broken arm, let's say, for example, it's an arthritic problem, which is a more chronic problem. Then we have to look at dealing with the trigger rather than just dealing with the symptom. So generally, when you're managing pain, you're looking at the non-opioids. So that would be something like acetaminophen. So paracetamol, for example, aspirin, the non-steroidal anti-inflammatories. These are great, but they have long-term problems in the body. So for example, the non-steroidals that people take for arthritic pain trash your kidneys so people develop with long-term use of the non-steroidals they develop kidney problems acetaminophen which is paracetamol paracetamol causes liver problems and at this point i want to mention something because it is worth knowing is that there is a particular gene snip so it's um i'm going to address genes just now but it causes a problem with how the liver detoxifies and sometimes parents only know that their child has got a problem with their liver and a particular gene that, that means their body cannot um, detoxify paracetamol. Now, paracetamol, you can literally just buy, you, you can just go into any, well, you can go to checker, checkers and get pediatric paracetamol. So I'm, I'm saying this because one needs to be aware that just because it's sold over the counter doesn't mean to say that it is, you know, it's risk free. Then you've got the opioids and the, you know, the, the strong opioids and the weak opioids. Now, in actual fact, what's happening worldwide is the, the, the biggest problem are the opioids. People are, are developing dependencies on opioids and they can't get off them they're struggling to get off, get off them so to use strong painkillers for any long duration that is longer than 10 days is 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 very ill advised because of the dependency issues and again we don't necessarily realize something like mypridol for example has got an opioid base because it's got codeine in it and codeine is an opioid and it's lovely when you when you need it because it works so well but again long term very strong ones like ketamine, but what we want to address here are the, the sort of more adjuvant treatments. So what we want to look at is we want to look at how, how we can relieve pain by relieving associated inflammation, or what we want to do is we want to help how the body perceives pain. Because pain, I mean, I'm sure you know, especially when, I mean, I'll use the example of man flu. When a woman has flu, you know what, you know, she gets up and she goes to work and she does the cooking and she deals with the children. When a man has that self-same flu, you know, man flu is, you know, they're virtually on death's door. But pain is also perceived in a different way. So sometimes just in dealing with chronic pain, if you can address the perception of the pain, it makes the pain move from being unmanageable 
to being manageable. And we're going to look at all of those issues. So my favorite analogy is the difference between, for example, working with an integrated approach to pain management and a traditional approach to pain management. A traditional approach to pain management is as follows. You sit on a drawing pin. You feel the pain from the drawing pin. You go to the doctor and the doctor gives you a non-steroidal and an analgesic for the pain of the drawing pin. If you go to and you work from an integrated um, perspective, you remove the drawing pin first and then you work with managing the pain or you work with the two concurrently. If you don't remove the drawing pin, it seems like, I mean, it seems like a no brainer that you need to try and remove the drawing pin. But, you know, it's it's in, in pain management, that isn't actually a first line treatment. And, you know, it's really something that all of us need to consider. So different types of pain, you've got the trauma pain, the sudden acute, you fall and you, you know, you break your ankle. It's important in a traumatic pain you need the inflammation that comes with the pain is important because what it does, it actually kickstarts the whole healing process. But what one can do, even in traumatic pain, which is sudden and acute, you can increase the nutritional requirements for healing. So you can address aspects of the health of your body that will accelerate how the body deals with sudden and acute trauma. But interestingly, any exposure to inflammatory triggers which comes with um with with pain no attention is given to those so if the pain is slow if if it's a if it's a cause it's not an, an overt cause then generally the the traditional approach to addressing pain does not look at what was the root cause of that pain so there's no evaluation of that there's no removal of the root cause and from a long-term perspective, the management of that pain becomes suboptimal. So generally what happens with the traditional approach to pain is that you just sort of expect the body to manage the pain and you expect over time somehow the body is going to heal despite all the inflammatory cytokines that are flooding the body with that pain. But what one has to bear in mind is that if you are, for example, if you're older, your body's processes are that much slower. And sometimes the inflammatory um, sequelae that, that flood the body are more than your body's healing process can address. So one needs to almost go back to the beginning, start addressing the body's capacity to heal as well as removing the cause. So really, if you're going to effectively treat pain, you have to treat it on a multi-layered approach, not just put a little Band-Aid over it. And what I mean by that, not just give um, a, a, perhaps a non-steroidal anti-inflammatory or an analgesic, that would be a Band-Aid approach. The non-Band-Aid approach would be to find out what is the reason that you are struggling with pain. Let's address that first. We address whether or not we can um, support the body's natural healing process and Certainly do your band-aid approach as well. Because I, for example, have something called occipital neuritis, which is sort of shooting pains up the back of my head. And you've never seen anybody dash as fast as I do when I'm dashing for that, that medicine box to take my myopedal when I'm dealing with this. Because at the time it's 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 very acute and it's very unbearable. So what I want to just address here, generally, when you have the more chronic type pain. You might have a, um, a condition and you go off to your doctor and the doctor gives a name to the condition but doesn't address why you've got that condition in the first place. So for example, let's take migraines. Migraines is the name that is given to headaches with auras or scotomas. But what is not addressed is why is the patient getting the migraine, the migraine in the first place? So, for example, it might be magnesium deficiency or it might be hormonal changes as you um, build up to your period or as you build up towards menopause. Neuropathy is similar. So neuropathy is the name that is given to pain, tingling, muscle weakness, particularly with people who, who have got diabetes. But the question is why? Why is that patient experiencing that pain, that tingling, and that muscle weakness? Diabetic neuropathy is a very special case with that. 
fibromyalgia. Fibromyalgia is becoming more and more common. It's the name that's given to chronic muscle tenderness, fatigue, and sleep disorders. But why? From a functional medicine approach, we address fibromyalgia from the perspective of the body's mitochondria, which are our little energy storehouses. So fibromyalgia for us is a mitochondrial cytopathy. So we address it from that perspective. We don't just address it from, you know, sleep disorders, address the sleep disorder, um, the muscle tenderness, maybe go on to sort of long-term um, anti-inflammatories. That's just the Band-Aid approach. But also pain, people who've got gut pain, so ir irritable bowel syndrome or irritable bowel disease, so they've got constant pain in their sort of lower abdomen. Again, why do they have that? So you get the picture here. It's, it isn't just about addressing what the name is. We actually want to look at why is a person developing pain in the first place. Now, the other thing with pain, you know, we tend to think pain is sort of like one dimensional and it's really not. So when you have pain and you have inflammation that goes with the pain, Inflammation in the body always affects all the systems in the body. So inflammation affects our immune system. So when inflammation goes up, our immune system comes into play and our ability to deal with pathogens and the efficacy of our immune system is compromised. Similarly, when our immune system is compromised, generally we get inflammation as well. So those two are, are sort of, they run concurrently in the body. Neurologic, well, you know, that's a little bit of a no-brainer as well. We know generally with pain that our nerves are affected because we can feel the pain. But inflammation in the brain, we might not have a perception of pain when you're dealing with inflammation of the brain. But inflammation of the brain can lead to neurological issues such as Parkinson's or Alzheimer's. So when you're dealing with generalized chronic inflammation, it doesn't stop at that point where the pain is. It floods the whole body and it will cause inflammation in the brain concurrently. And inflammation in the brain is just something we do and we don't want to have. Metabolic problems, so it affects the way our body manages sugars. So for example, just an easy example here. If you're dealing with pain, what goes with pain is increased stress response. What goes with increased stress response is disordered metabolic cycles so disordered metabolic processes so your body doesn't metabolize sugars and constant and chronic problems with metabolizing sugars leads to insulin resistance and that increases your risks of developing diabetes so that's really just to illustrate that there's a knock-on effect when you're dealing with chronic pain and endocrine of course that deals with all your glands and you know how your body responds to your hormones and hormones are affected by inflammation as well so the pain frequency, you know, if you have a little look on Google, there are about 100 million hits on Google a month for people who are querying pain. It's why the pr practitioners are consulted very often. So I'm for my consults, one of my biggest ones is actually weight issues, you know, but because so it's weight, but pain is a very big one, how the body, how the people feel in their bodies. Sometimes it's acute. Again, we all know about that. We have structural damage. We, we, we sprain our ankle or we break something. But the problematic one, and that's really what we're looking at here, is the chronic pain. Because chronic pain is much harder to resolve. Something has to change in our lifestyle when you're dealing with chronic pain. And that's, that's very challenging. Because very often, if somebody's dealing with chronic pain, and they consult me, and I'll say to them, all right, in order to bring down your systemic inflammation, these are the steps that you need to take. And it might be giving up inflammatory foods of which gluten and dairy are, are both very inflammatory foods. And, you know, I, I can see the patient has got the stunned look on their face because, you know, when it means they've got to give up their, their cappuccino and their biscotti that comes with a cappuccino, then very often the attitude is, can't you just, can't I just take a pull? And that's why the sort of the fallback is just taking pills. But I, the, the thing is, the patients are not informed properly. You're not informed that long-term exposure to the pills causes long-term damage. And the further down that road you, you creep, the harder it is to come back. The other thing is, 
when you've got chronic pain, it ramps up your nociceptors. Now, your nociceptors are the are, are your sensory nerves that are that tell us we've got pain. So, in other words, what is our perception of that pain? And some people have more sensitive nociceptors than others, and very often that's a it's a genetic thing, which I'm going to talk about just now. All pain releases inflammatory cytokines, and the issue is not only to to slow down the release of the inflammatory cytokines, but it is also to clear the inflammatory cytokines from your system. So for example, tendon damage. Tendons by nature don't have a, have a large blood supply. You know That's why often if you see them in a diagram, they always look white. It's because they don't have a lot of blood. Now the issue with that is, let's say for example, you tear a tendon and there's no, there's not much blood in the area. Because there's not much blood, you can't clear the inflammatory cytokines. So part of treating tendon damage should be creating a situation where you reduce the inflammatory cytokines and you help to clear the inflammatory cytokines that the body has already produced. So chronic non-communicable diseases are all rooted in inflammation. So they are stroke, heart attack, cancer, um, osteo osteoarthritis, osteoporosis, all of these have their root in inflammation. So if one is going to look at a multi-pronged approach to reducing our risk of developing these chronic diseases, to address inflammation in our body is almost a first line. Now, when you're looking at the cycle of all disease, you look at chronic inflammation, which manifests as chronic pain. This increases our risk other disease involvement, which increases inflammation. And this leads to more chronic disease and more inflammation. So addressing the root cause of the chronic pain, therefore the chronic inflammation helps to reverse that circle. So the consequences of untreated chronic inflammation, and there are lots of them, but the biggies are heart disease, stroke, I've mentioned those. Cancer, little things like constipation or diarrhea, autism, diabetes, rheumatoid arthritis, Alzheimer's, Parkinson's disease are the brain ones, learning disorders, ADD, ADHD, chronic fatigue, depression, migraines, any autoimmune disorders, and obviously chronic infections. So when you have untreated chronic inflammation from any cause, it increases your risks of developing any one of these conditions that also have their root in chronic inflammation. So just leaving it and thinking, oh, you know, it will resolve itself or, you know, I haven't got time to make changes or I don't know what changes to make isn't, isn't a good idea because you are, you are going on the road where it's like a snowball. It starts gathering momentum towards these sort of chronic inflammatory conditions. So the sequelae that happen with inflammation, what happens is that you get low adrenal function. So when you're chronically inflamed, your adrenal function starts to slow down. And when your adrenal function slows down, then you can get the fatigue, you get mood imbalances, sleep difficulties. And you know what happens when we don't sleep? Our sensitivity to pain increases. And when we don't sleep, our weight management just sort of goes out the window. Your immune function increases. And what do you get? sleep disorders, back to sleep disorders, fatigue, weight management issues, brain issues, so poor memory, brain fog, muscle aches. So you see the overlap with that. What goes with high inflammation is high oxidative stress. So oxidative stress, I'm going to talk about just now, but basically oxidative stress is when your body produces too many free radicals and free radicals in the system damage cellular structures so free radicals will damage cell membranes for example so a little bit of free radical the body can cope with but when you've got a high output of free radicals you have a high oxidative stress you've got side effects from the high oxidative stress of brain fog that amy is yuppie flu chronic pain again, Parkinson's. Parkinson's is, is very closely associated with high oxidative stress in the brain. And all of these lead to poor quality of life. So, you know, I don't know how many people are going to be listening to the recording who are really, really struggling with pain. But when you struggle with pain, you just know 
you 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 can't even do retail therapy because you're in you your your pain levels are so bad you can't sleep properly and you just you just drop into this downward cycle where the quality of your life gets worse and worse and you know sometimes you can be so far along that path that to get back is really a really a struggle you know and I, I, I sympathize so much because pain has such a bad impact on our our vitality and our enjoyment so when we're addressing pain we need to address all of these functions together. So you want to address the low adrenal function. We want to address the sleep is always a big one that I start with. Weight management. People, for example, who are struggling with, with if they're overweight, not only does excess fat, fat cause a lot of excess inflammatory cytokines, but the demand on the body is that much greater. So one wants to look at that. You need to address the high immune function. So what one wants to do is you want to cool the body's immune response. And you do that concurrently. So what causes the body's immune function to increase? Certain food sensitivities. Now, you may not be allergic to the food, but you may be sensitive to food. And gluten is not, it isn't just a fad. I know one tends to think, you know, it's sometimes fashionable to be gluten sensitive or you know gluten allergies but in actual fact what gluten does gluten is a protein in wheat gliadin and our body cannot actually digest the peptide so the little peptide chain so the protein chain our body's not designed to break that down effectively so it causes two two main problems the one problem is that it, it almost works like a pot scara it scrubs off the nice thick mucous membrane or mucous lining that we have in our gut. So it causes these little holes in the mucus and it exposes our very, very fragile gut lining. The second thing it does, it stimulates an agent. It's a molecule called zonulin. Now, zonulin is a natural product. Your, your cells produce it. And it's very good in some cases because what zonulin does is it when the body needs to increase the permeability of the gut, in other words, it needs water to flow in or out of the gut, then zonulin is released. But the problem is normally our gut junctions, the, the cells that keep what's in our gut, in our gut and not seeping out into our bloodstream are these very tight junctions in the gut. Now, if you've got gluten scrubbing off the, the, the mucus protection and you've got gluten stimulating zonulin that opens the gut junctions. Now what happens is our gut bugs that are supposed to stay in our gut, very important gut bugs, but they must stay in the gut. They creep across the, the membranes or sometimes our partially digested food. Now what happens, our immune system, our immune system, is, it doesn't expect to see partially digested food in our bloodstream so it overreacts to that if you have a, a continuous or chronic overreaction in the immune system where our immune system is on alert high alert all the time it just starts slapping away at anything you know it's supposed to distinguish self from non-self and eventually what happens when our immune system is constantly stimulated um, stimulated it starts attacking our self and that's where the autoimmune conditions come in so for example rheumatoid arthritis psoriasis multiple sclerosis um, lupus these are all autoimmune conditions and they are conditions where our immune system is overactive graves hashimoto's our immune system is all overactive so we want to cool the immune system down we want to address the high oxidative stress so we want to reduce the amount of free radicals that are damaging our cell membranes, for example. We want to make sure that our mitochondria, which are the little energy storehouses, very, very important mitochondria. Without mitochondria, we would die. Our mitochondria produce our energy, are produced in a little pocket called ATP. And when the ATP is produced, this is the energy currency that we use actually to stay alive. But our mitochondria are very sensitive to oxidative stress they're very sensitive to re, to free radicals so we want to make sure free radicals are low so our mitochondria are happy and healthy snip involvement there is gene involvement i'll talk about that just now and we also need to when we're addressing inflammation we need to eat 
high nutrient dense food because this is how our body heals. If we eat Twinkies and drink Coca Cola, there are no nutrients for our body to cope. So our diet very often is very high in inflammatory. Um, I don't even want to call them foods, but anyway, let's call them inflammatory agents. So, and our body can't heal properly if it doesn't have enough protein or, nu or nutrients. Now, non-surgical pain management, for example, cortisone is very commonly used. Cortisone is great, but it's temporary. You know, you can't just stay on cortisone forever. Those people who've been on cortisone, especially for lung conditions, first of all, you just know that you gain a lot of weight when you're on cortisone. So cortisone is fine as a sort of a temporary anti-inflammatory. Nerve modulation. So these would be, for example, things like your TENS machines. Um, if, you, if you're wanting to have a look at pain management, MRI, so to try and find out what's going on. Very often, specialists will not even address your pain without an MRI, which is very expensive. How many of us can afford, what's it now, between 10 and 12,000 rand for an MRI? You can look at the topical analgesics or anti-inflammatories. So non-steroidal anti-inflammatories, they, they're fine. They, they work nicely, but they trash the kidneys. Codeine, which is a, a morphine derivative, and of course, that leads to dependencies. Acetaminophen, we've already addressed acetaminophen. So that's that's Panado. And as I say, certain people have a particular gene. So it's a, it's a, it's a gene that doesn't detoxify acetaminophen very well. And then they can get liver toxicity. Sometimes you only know, you know, let's say, for example, you go for surgery and they put you onto acetaminophen, which they, they do routinely. And you only know when you start to keep it yellow and you think, oh, you know, what's going on now that your liver is, is sort of under strain and it's more common than one thinks. Then you've got the concurrent functional support. You know, how do you go about this? And that's, we're touching on that now, which is address your immune response and address your inflammatory response. So when you're looking at chronic inflammation, I've addressed some of them. Um, we're going to discuss the perception of pain you want to remove exacerbating factors. So I've spoken about sleep. Getting good sleep when you struggle with pain is extremely important. And getting good sleep is not just about taking a sleeping pill because your sleep cycles, and we've actually done a webinar on this, haven't we, Stace? Your sleep cycles, the natural sleep cycle, is important for a lot of reasons. If you just take a sleeping pill, it's a bit like saying, you know, if I hit you over the head with a hammer, and I knock you unconscious, it's the same benefit to your body than sleep. It's just not at all. So um, sleeping pills basically knock you unconscious. And there are ways to address sleep that don't involve sleeping pills. One re needs to remo remove um, or address any low-grade infection. So for example, candida. Candida is extremely common. If you've got candida infection and you've got some other type of inflammation you need to address the two concurrently because your body is on constantly high inflammation if you if you if your immune system is trying to deal with a candida infection so it's important to address that parasites are another one if your immune system's on high alert because you, you've got intestinal parasites and your immune system's tightly linked with your inflammatory process any other inflammatory conditions you've got will not resolve if you don't resolve triggers other triggers for inflammation stress very very big one stress not only increases our perception of pain but it increases our inflammatory response inflammatory foods we've we've touched on that toxin exposure so heavy metals for example they increase our body's generalized pain and inflammation response and I've, uh, we've spoken about reduced oxidative stress so when you're down regulating the cytokines, so cytokines are inflammatory messengers, non-steroidals will do that, but they also increase your blood pressure, they can cause heart attacks, and they can cause kidney failure. One can also use agents like curcumin. So curcumin is a good anti-inflammatory. I'm not saying that um, agents like curcumin and ginger don't have side effects. Some of them do have side effects. So one needs to be careful of them but the side effect profile is less than the side effect profile very often if you're dealing with a you know the obviously the stronger um, non-steroidals or the stronger analgesics you also need to add anti-inflammatory foods now probiotics can be very 
inflammatory or anti-inflammatory. Now, if you have a diet that's very high in sugars or carbohydrates, the gut bugs that are stimulated by this diet tend to be very pro-inflammatory. So they stimulate inflammation. Whereas if you have a diet that is sort of lower in the sugars and the carbs, the, the, the gut bugs that are promote tend to be anti-inflammatory. So within our own bodies, we've got regulators in our gut bugs that help to regulate whether our body tends to be pro-inflammatory or whether our body tends to be anti-inflammatory. The other thing, food additives. Now, we don't always, always know. I think what happens is that when people are, are the food technologists are um, combining foods, they have to put, by law, they have to list certain food additives. But if an agent is used in the process of making the food, and I haven't got the word right for that, but it slips my tongue for the moment, they're not, they're not legally obligated to list it. So, for example, let's say you love hot chips. And off you touch to steers or wherever, and they make these delicious, yummy, yummy hot chips, and you tend to have them quite frequently. What we don't realize is that that oil that the hot chips are cooked in is, is reused several times a day, sometimes for up to two weeks. Now, as that oil is um, processed, first of all, the oil itself, as it's heated to high heat, produces acrylamides, and acrylamides are, are sort of, um, they're carcinogenic, but in producing that oil, they have to deodorize it and sanitize it. And they use agents to deodorize it and sanitize it. And, and that basically are, they don't have to list them. And that it, one of them, it's got the same chemical formula, a formula as brake fluid. I can't remember the name of it, but I was horrified when I read that. So it, one just needs to be aware that that, that sometimes what is what is used to create a particular food there's no listing. You know, we all know the E's and we've got to stay away from the E's and, you know, those sort of things. But what if we don't know about it? And what we want to do is we want to upregulate the repair process. So we want to increase our basic nutrient status and we want to make sure that our mitochondria that produce our energy is at its most vital. So when you are, when you, okay, this is sort of more professionals, but basically what one needs to do is that you need to find what is your baseline health? In other words, sometimes if you have a chronic problem, this would be how I would deal with a patient. If a patient comes to me with chronic inflammation, the first thing I need to do is find out what is their lifestyle. So I look at what foods are they eating? They have to do a three-day diet diary with me so that I can see exactly what foods they're eating. Because very often they think they're eating healthy foods. And I'll give you a good example, spinach. Spinach is, is touted as being one of the superfoods, and yet quite a high percentage of people are sensitive to oxalates, and spinach is very high in oxalates. So if you have these green smoothies and you eat them a lot and you can't understand why you have such severe joint pain, it's my job to have a look and see what are you eating that could be a problem. Histamine is another one. Histamine people who have have histamine problems, are sensitive to foods that are high in histamine. Strawberries, for example, are very high in histamine. So are bananas. So people who have histamine response, if you have high histamine response, you are going to be in a chronic inflammatory state. And often it's created by foodstuffs. We also need to look at expectations because when you're dealing with lifestyle changes to deal with chronic inflammation, it's not overnight. There have to be changes. And you might have taken let's say 20 or 30 years to develop to where you are now where you're dealing with severe chronic pain and we can't undo that overnight sometimes it's going to take six months or a year to undo that and it does require dedication you, you know I like to think that that patients who are in extreme pain will do anything to undo that extreme pain but the problem is trusting that the process that they're going to walk down that does require some sacrifice is going to get them to a state where they are more comfortable in their body and I think that's really where a lot of challenge comes 
we need to address a diet and we need to address sleep. So usually if a patient comes to me with chronic pain conditions, the first thing that I address is their diet and can currently on the back of that, I address sleep. Because what we need to do is we need to remove all the inflammatory triggers so that we can cool the body as much as possible so that their particular pain problem, let's say, for example, it's lower back pain. And their particular pain problem becomes the only source of inflammation so that the body can get on top of addressing that inflammation and isn't so spread or spread so thinly over the body because of all the other inflammatory triggers that you happen to be exposing the body to. One wants to address stress, so breathing and meditation. Breathing and meditation and, and massages and that are not luxuries. They are actually essential to help the body just cope with the cortisol flood that happens. And you get into that vicious cycle because, of course, when you're in pain, you're constantly stressed. You know, you, your shoulders are up past your ears. You know, you tense all the time while you're trying to deal with that, with that severe pain response. So it's understandable that stress is going to be a big player. And then you get that vicious cycle. We need to address nutrients. So in addressing nutrients, we address the oxidative stress. In other words, what nutrients that are going to help to reduce the free radicals that are floating in the body and certain nutrients are better at creating repair and healing. So again, here's a vicious cycle. As people get older, what happens is that their the stomach acid is not as efficient as it is when they were younger, as it was when they were younger. So they tend to not eat enough protein and without enough protein, your body cannot repair. So, so making sure that somebody has not only ingesting enough protein, but is their, is their body actually able to digest it is something that we need to look at. In some cases, one needs to address or refer for structural imbalances. So, for example, let's say somebody's got lower back pain because they've got leg length discrepancy or a spinal rotation. You know, then you need one needs to work concurrently with a practitioner who can address the structural imbalances. So maybe um podiatrist or a physiotherapist or or you know any specialist can act that can help deal with those structural imbalances. And then obviously one does need to consider additional treatments. So nerve blocks or cortisone injections or any of these that can work to help the short term so that you can actually take a breath and get into making long-term changes. Um, we've sort of addressed, I'm actually not going to go into too much detail on this one because how's my time, Stace? I think okay. the time is quite good. Jules, you've still got 15 okay, minutes. Okay, for, oh, 15 minutes, not a lot. All right. Okay. <laughs> Thanks. <laughs> All right, so inflammation, the process of inflammation leads to increasing cytokines, which are inflammatory. Increase in immune neurotransmitters, so that's in, that happens in the brain and it happens at the at the the nerve synapse in the body. Increase in free radicals and then of course increase in oxidative stress. So uh, one of the primary treatments, as I've said, is to deal with the oxidative capacity. Now your oxidative capacity is influenced by your genes and your lifestyle, and some people, for example, um, inherit genes that mean the oxidative capacity is diminished. Now, obviously, in a situation like this, I don't do gene profiles on everybody because gene profiles, although they're not as expensive as they used to be, you know, they're still expensive. And very often one can still address uh, pain and you can address inflammation by not necessarily looking at the genes. But addressing the, the, the free radicals is very important underlying all of our inflammatory treatments. So certain conditions, so for example, if a patient has diabetes or they're obese or they've got cancer or they're just going through the normal aging process, all of these increase the body's oxidative stress. These are just natural processes that increase the body's oxidative stress. So if you have all of these natural processes happening and then you lift up a heavy box and you and you, you pull a muscle in your lower back. Now you can just see what the flood of oxidative stress is already in the body. So the body now has to combat not only the stress and the damage that's happened from that acute injury, 
but it has to overcome the, the number of free radicals that the body's just producing, just dealing with any one of these conditions. Hypertension, how common is hypertension? Really, really common. You know, so they 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 just add to the load. So um, one thing I want to mention here is ferritin. So when you're looking at oxidative stress, in other words, the, the, the free radicals that the body produces, one of the blood tests that's so easy to get that is hardly ever routinely tested is ferritin. Now, ferritin looks at stored iron. Now, if you have high ferritin, it's extremely inflammatory. So men and menopausal women should get their ferritin checked every single year. Now, in general, if you look at the, the, the margins that Lancet or Ampath and that they allow for, they will allow for a ferritin of up to 400 before they say, put a little H next to it to say that it's high. I would have a stroke if my ferritin was 400. I want ferritin to be between 90 and 110 with women and maybe up to 150 with men. If one finds that ferritin is high, and please, the next time you go to your doctors, please test your ferritin. If the ferritin is high, it's so easy to treat. You just trot off and you go and give blood. You, you, do, you donate blood. Your, your recipient of your blood can be grateful for the slightly higher iron because, of course, iron carries your oxygen. It helps to reduce your inflammatory exposure. So it is it is one of those blood tests that should be done routinely. Um, what have I not addressed here? Uh, all right. So when you look at your genes, I'll just touch on it. The genes that are involved in oxidative capacity. In other words, whether or not the body has lots of free radicals. You've got a couple of these superoxide dismutase, these catalase, your glutathione. I think everybody's heard of glutathione. So glutathione really is our, our main um, free radical sponge, really. It addresses our free radicals. And uh, some people have deletions. Now, I happen to be one of them. I have two deletions in my glutathione capacity. In other words, it's not even that my genes that produce glutathione are but substandard. I just don't have them at all. So I have to be very careful upstream to make sure that I don't expose my body to a lot of free radicals because my glutathione capacity is, is diminished. And because I know that, you know, I can I'm, I'm careful as I get older where the body's producing more free radicals just from the normal aging process. I'm careful to make sure that I um, I eat foods that, that will work like free radical sponges. So foods that are high in vitamin C, for example, high in vitamin E, all of these help to address your free radicals. And then please don't expose your body to extra free radicals. I mean, it, it's again, it's a no-brainer, smoking, alcohol, pollution, any medication, stress, all produce lots and lots of free radicals. Um, let's go through. Okay, so all of these SNPs that I've actually highlighted here are all genes that influence inflammation. We don't even test for all of these. You know, the ones that I've highlighted here are the ones that we test for here in South Africa. And they're useful. It is useful to have a look at these. It's, it is especially useful if you have a history. So if you've got a familial history of cancer or Alzheimer's or um or heart disease, it is worth getting your genes checked to see whether or not you've got some of the genes, what I call the soft spots, that are genes that will predispose to slightly increased risk of any of these conditions, because there are definitely steps that you can take far down the line that will reduce your risks of developing these. And you know that the, the best treatment for cancer is don't get cancer in the first place. You know, so if there's anything that you can do, for example, that can help reduce your risk, I think it sort of behooves us to, to really do what we need to. Now, the other thing is to improve your perception of pain. So certain things help to, to block the body's perception of pain. So for example, if the body's very acid, we tend to feel pain more strongly. So alkalizing the body sometimes helps. So sometimes if you just take, take um, Alka-Seltzer, what do we have in South Africa? Alka-Seltzer is not a South African thing, is it? Um, if you just take bicarb, if, you, if you're dealing with pain, just to help neutralize the body for that for that period, that can help. Now, GABA, GABA is actually a wonderful agent. You can actually buy it off the shelf. 
it's an inhibiting neurotransmitter. So what it does is it blankets, it calms down the neurotransmitters in the brain. And the neurotransmitters are chemicals that can either calm the nerves down or excite the nerves. So for example, aspartame that we have in our artificial sweeteners is aspartate. And aspartate is, is actually an excitatory neurotransmitter. So what it does is it overstimulates the nerves. So if you are somebody who has chronic pain, you need to stay away from, from MSG, for example, or any artificial sweeteners. Glutamate, glutamate is another neurotransmitter that's excitatory neurotransmitter, it stimulates the nerves. So MSG and any of the artificial sweeteners, they just must be a no-no if you struggle with chronic pain. But one can also take GABA. So um, as I said, you can just buy it off the shelf and it just cools the, the neurotransmitters down a little bit. So it calms the adrenaline down. Now, um, it actually also happens to give you interesting dreams because I sometimes take GABA if, I've, if, I'm, if I'm ruminating. So if something's happened and my brain's going round and round and round, then I'll take GABA and it just calms my brain down. But <laughs> it also gives me interesting dreams. So sometimes if life's a bit dull, I think, oh, I think I'll take a GABA just so I can have interesting dreams that night. Theanine, so um, you can buy, again, you can buy theanine as a supplement. It increases GABA and serotonin, and it blocks glutamate. So remember I said glutamate is an excitatory neurotransmitter, and theanine blocks it. So exercise, exercise is really, really good, even though it seems a little bit counterintuitive if, you, if you're having pain to actually exercise, but it, it, it really helps that process. Improving sleep is very important. Unfortunately, improving sleep is, is a lecture all on its own, you know, so I'm just going to leave it at improving sleep. Increasing vitamin D. Vitamin D is very, very good to help down-regulate the perception of pain. Progesterone is another one. So especially for women, as we get older and our progesterone drops off, so as we sometimes from as young as 35, but sometimes even women in their 20s have low levels of progesterone and progesterone is remarkable for actually keeping the brain calm and keeping the body calm so reducing the inflammatory response and in actual fact progesterone now is given in traumatic brain injuries so what they do sometimes if there is some kind of a traumatic brain industry um, injury they give the patient high levels of progesterone because it works like um it's very neuroprotective so it keeps the nerves calmer both excess estrogen and testosterone are excitatory. So um, women, again, we get something called estrogen. Um, it's an excess estrogen condition. Estrogen, oh God, the brain, my, my brain's not working very well, but anyway. Um, and then what happens is that our ratio of estrogen to, it's estrogen dominance, sorry, that took a beat. Our ratio of estrogen to progesterone means we have too much estrogen, too little progesterone, and that estrogen dominance increases our perceptions of pain. And that's why very often, depending on where we are in our cycle, so women who've got their periods, there are certain times in the month where they are extremely sensitive to pain and other times where they're just not. Now, what are the lab tests? I'm sort of winding down now a little bit. What are the lab tests that you can, take to look at your pain levels or your inflammatory level levels high sensitive c-reactive protein this is distinguished from just normal c-reactive protein go for high sensitive c-reactive protein it should be less than one if you're a man and less than 0.5 if you're a woman and it's important because if you've got high high sensitive c-reactive protein it increases your risk profiles for developing any cardiac event so get that tested routinely. CBC complete blood count, a ferritin I've mentioned. One, one wants to have a look at your bacterial infection. So if you, for, exa for example, got, and they'll look at your urinalysis for that to see have you got any low-grade bacterial infections. Candida I mentioned. Vitamin D status. Now, to get your vitamin D levels checked, you want your vitamin D levels to be around about 60 even though on the lab test it says if it's 30 it's sufficient there's a big difference between 30 31 where the lab test will say you're sufficient and 60 which is optimal we want to keep our vitamin d levels optimal and it's another thing that happens as you get older because as you get older we tend not to go out in the sun 
So our vitamin D status starts to drop and vitamin D is very important in our immune system as well to keep our immune system in a balanced state. And because of course, if your immune system's out, your inflammatory processes are out as well. And to do a thyroid panel, these are all lab tests that are important, but interpreting the lab tests, you would probably need to come to a functional medicine practitioner or chat to your doctor about interpreting the lab tests. I'm going to skip over this. And I have spoken about vitamin D. So um, vitamin D is not only anti-inflammatory, but it modulates your immune system and it improves your neuromuscular coordination. So this is important because as you get older and you get a bit wobbly on your pins and your, your risk of falling increases, addressing vitamin D to make sure you don't fall, to make sure you don't hurt yourself, to start that negative spiral for long-term inflammation, addressing vitamin D helps that. And it affects your serotonin receptors. And remember, serotonin is your feel-good neurotransmitter. It helps, it helps you cope better. So when you are feeling a beat, you manage your pain so much better. Stress management is right up there with sleep. So sleep and stress management. So normally again, one would need a little bit of guide guidance on this, but cortisol measured i'm not pro getting one cortisol measurement you know the morning cortisol it doesn't really tell you anything to do a proper cortisol profile you actually need a four times in one day salivary check because then one can see exactly where the cortisol is and where it should be so the blood test for cortisol really is oh, it's just not helpful at all mitochondrial health is very important that is a very big subject all on its own Sleep, yoga, meditation, stress, and weight management. So managing your stress and managing your weight. If one is extremely overweight and you've got a chronic inflammatory condition, one does need to address the weight because fat produces inflammatory cytokines. Botanicals and nutraceuticals do work, but obviously it depends on the plant. You know, so often the response in the body is it's similar to pharmaceuticals, but it has less side effects. But I say less side effects, not no side effects. So, for example, very, very high doses of ginger. Some people have described with ginger, slight coming and going, the, the vision gets a little bit blurred with, um, with ginger. I'm not quite sure why, but it is one of the side effects that happens with very, very high doses of ginger. So the very clean diets, so the paleo diets that don't have a lot of, they don't have grains. So they basically are good quality meat, vegetables, salads, good quality fats like avocados and nuts. And um, when stick, you, you stay away from grains, grains and beans actually are quite high in an agent called lectin. So lectin is an anti-nutrient and certain people are sensitive to lectins. And I've mentioned that certain people are sensitive to histamine and certain people are sensitive to oxalates. So that's why sometimes foods that you, you think these are superfoods, I should be eating these. Sometimes the foods themselves are a problem. So oxalates, if I just go back to oxalates, oxalates are broken down in the body by like one of our gut bugs. But if you've been on high doses or regular doses of antibiotics, that gut bug is gone. So your body can't break down oxalates. So in those particular incidents, the oxalates build up and they cause joint inflammation. They cause interstitial cystitis because basically ox oxalates are like crystals. So um, it's these are specific approaches to inflammation that need to be established. So with a patient, you need to see the patient as an individual and look at what are all the possible triggers for inflammation that we need to address to address the whole inflammation as a picture and it's a multi-treatment approach it's a multi-dimensional approach certain foods so the very pro-inflammatory foods we all know this we just want to ignore it because all the yummy things are on the pro-inflammatory side so sugar and high carb breads you know the body that can't tell the difference between bread and a teaspoon of sugar and sugar is very pro-inflammatory and sugar triggers insulin and insulin's pro-inflammatory trans fats and even though oh, we see it on biscuits no trans fats because the consumer industry has worked out worked out or oh, sorry the 
the agriculture or the biscuit makers have worked out that, you know, now the consumers are getting wise to this, so they don't want to have trans fats. But it's not, I mean, they don't add anything that's any more healthy. They just call it by a different name. So, for example, MSG. They say no MSG, but then they say, um, what do they like to call it? Protein extract. So protein extract, they just, it's actually MSG. They've just called it by a different name. So they, they hide it for us. So very often cooking clean. So you buy clean and you cook at home. So if you want to have your hot chips, have them, but you, you cook them at home because you're not reusing that fat and the inflammatory cytokines and all that are not triggered by whatever else they put in the food. Vegetable oils. Now that's your canola oil, your sunflower oil, palm oil. Vegetable oils now are being cited as almost the number one uh, trigger for heart disease. So thinking that butter is bad, vegetable oil is good, that is no longer the case anymore. We now know that saturated fats are less inflammatory in the body than vegetable oils. Alcohol. Now, this is it's a difficult one because alcohol very often helps to calm one. So sometimes we'll have alcohol to manage our stress because we know our stress increases our pain response. But alcohol in excess causes that vicious cycle. And it's the same thing as cannabis. So now cannabis can have pro, a good response in the body and a negative response in the body. So, and it depends on the person. It depends on their gene profiles. So very often people, you know, the, the, the proponents of cannabis, they will say, you know, this is wonderful and it reduces your risk of cancer. And yes, in some people that it does, it does. But in some people it doesn't, you know, so every person has to be addressed as an individual and a lot of guesswork is involved. And, you know, I would love to say, you know, I could be like fairy godmother and wave a magic wand and, you know, know exactly what your all the factors that feed into your inflammatory response are, but it's impossible for me to know that without spending a lot of your money to try and determine what they are. So usually it's a lot of educated guesswork, but the primary treatment is, is to remove inflammatory foods. Fructose is another one. Now in any in all these cans of cool drinks, very high levels of fructose. Fructose affects the liver directly and it affects the inflammatory response. So staying away from those is almost like a, you know, it's a, it's it's a, the first thing that we deal with. The anti-inflammatory approach with food. So your antioxidants, I spoke about that because remember I spoke about that oxidative stress. So vitamin C, vitamin A, vitamin E, and selenium. Selenium is a wonderful agent because selenium also binds uh, mercury. So if we're exposed to mercury, which we are, because apparently even the planes flying over, they, they release mercury into the air. To take selenium, it's an antioxidant and it binds mercury. Your methylating compounds, so all of your vitamin Bs are important because the methylation process is important as a detox and as an anti-inflammatory, um, it helps the inflammatory response in the body. Minerals like zinc, magnesium is a wonderful, wonderful mineral. I, if, if I could, I would want everybody to be on magnesium. Omega-3 as well. So omega-3 versus omega-6s. So omega-6s are the vegetable oils. Omega-3s are the fish oils. Omega-3s reduce your body's inflammatory response. Omega-6 increases your body's inflammatory response. So one wants to have more omega-3s and less omega-6s. And your phytonutrients, so for example, turmeric. All right, so choose your non-starchy vegetables, good quality fats, your oily fish, low GI fruits and avoid grains or whole grains. So just avoid wheat and grains entirely if you've got an inflammatory or pain problem. You want to avoid your seeds because seeds are very high in omega-6. So even though seeds on a healthy person are great because they've got other vitamins, if you've got a pain response, you stay away from seeds. You want to limit your legumes and your beans because they're high in lectins and lectins are very inflammatory. So even though a lot of these foods, you think, okay, well, these are healthy foods. Yes, they are for a child, but not for somebody who's dealing with an inflammatory pain response. Peanuts. Peanuts are, actually, they are not a nut. They are a, they're a, what do they call it? It's a legume. But the thing with peanuts is they store them in these big silos and they, they develop a phloxin, which is a mold. 
And then we, we of course, consume the peanuts and the mold. And then now our body's immune system has to now deal with all the mold. So now the immune system's up and the inflammatory process goes up with it. Poultry. So chicken's actually quite pro-inflammatory, which is very sad to know. Vegetable oils, I've mentioned. Now, organ meats, I put a little question mark next to them because organ meats are so good for other reasons that I do think you should have some organ meats. So you should have some liver, especially pasture-raised, um, ox or calf liver, beef liver, but just don't have it all the time. So maybe once a week have that because it's so good for the vitamin Bs and um, the, the right ratio of copper and all that. So there are other good reasons to have organ meats. Okay, we've addressed all of those. Oxalate lectins, nitrates, salicylates, nitrates, and sulfites. Avoid, we've addressed oh, all sugar. It's very sad. Fried foods, fruit juice, any refined grains. So that's white flour, gluten, gluten-free. Rather have gluten-free breads. Or gl gluten-free breads are not healthy. They're just gluten-free. So they will reduce the exposure to flour, but they're not anti-inflammatory. Cheese is quite inflammatory. Corn is inflammatory. White potatoes. White potatoes are very high in nightshades. And any charred protein. So all our lovely South African brides where we have these very crispy bits of meat, they increase our body's inflammatory response. Uh, what have I left out? Let me just have a look here. The last thing I think I want to mention, statins. Why do statins cause pain? A lot of people are on statins now to reduce cholesterol. Now, statins are very good at reducing cholesterol. They do a great job of doing that, but they block something called the mevalinate pathway. And that mevalinate pathway is responsible for making an, an agent called coenzyme Q10. And coenzyme Q10 is primary in the production of ATP in the mitochondria. So when somebody is on high dose statin, Basically, what they're doing is they're poisoning their mitochondria. And if you poison your mitochondria, your body can't produce energy. And of course, our heart is a muscle. So we get muscle pains from the reduction in ATP output of the mitochondria in the muscle. But that also happens in the heart. So whether or not one stays on statins is something you need to discuss with your doctor. But if there's any way that you can go off them, it is better long term for the body. And we are done. I hope I came in on time there. If you have any questions, I think we are going to do a question and answer session at some point, but I think we'll just wait for the recording to go out and see if anybody wants to join us in a Q&A session for their own specific problems. But um, if anybody's got like any questions right now, let's see if we can just... Uh, so no questions from our side. I just wanted to say thank you. It was very informative. And I can tell you could probably speak for another three hours if you had to. It was I could, really yeah. detailed. <laughs> um, and I think the fact that I've, um, you know, had treatment for inflammatory, um, the natural way, as I said, I was seeing a kinesiologist. Oh, I still see you actually. Um, a lot of it did make sense, but there was so much more detail that I didn't know and didn't understand. So, yeah, thank you. And I completely, you know, agree with your approach to rather do it the natural way as opposed to taking a pain pill. I hate pain pills. I really just do take them when it's absolutely necessary. But then also try and figure out why. If I've got a headache, am I dehydrated? Um, or is it like really something else? Is it stress or whatever the case may be? <clears throat> And I still, to this day, I mean, I've been treated by a kinesiologist now for probably like six, seven years, the seventh year now. But I still, because you still, you know, have stress and you still get exposed to free radicals and all of that. Um, I do just see her for maintenance and make sure that, you know, whatever I can use that's natural just manages, you know, my condition. But I just wanted to say thanks. Thanks, Linda. Thanks. Yeah, wonderful. Thank you so much, Linda. And Jules, thank you so much. You are just a wealth of knowledge. While you were talking, I actually thought, Jules, you could be classified as our medical Google. Honestly, like I don't know a question that I've ever asked you that you haven't been able to give us the full definition of it, where it comes from, what it causes, what it causes, and how to treat it. So thank you so much for everything, 
all of your knowledge that you bring to us and and just in your free time it's just it's incredible thank you and um, Jules, while you were talking I just it was like this download I know I just have to put this in there like what, what Linda was saying um I have recently come to understand that I'm allergic to MSG and one of the side effects is I get the itchiest nose but I get the most insane headache so it just shows, like, as you were talking, I was like, well, Garrett is once again. So thank you. 